Half-Life 2 is a bright, action-packed shooter up until the moment it isn't, which is when you step into Ravenholm and see this. This area looks different from any other map in the game. It's dark and spooky and there are birds all of a sudden, but it still somehow feels like a Half-Life level, flowing seamlessly from the maps before and after it. This is because Ravenholm exemplifies all of the level design guidelines that make Valve games so darn good. Guidelines publicly available in GDC talks, commentary tracks, internal wiki pages, and behind the scene books if you're willing to dig through them. I am willing to dig through them. So for a change of pace, how about we do go to Ravenholm to learn more about the Valve way of designing levels? That tunnel is sealed for a reason. The first step is a strong core concept, not for the map shape or style, but the narrative idea behind the level. Why are you here and where are you going? You know, the easy questions in life. The concept might be capture the flag or earn the love of your surrogate mother by beating her whimsical death trap. Whatever the goal, the game should clearly communicate to the player not just what they're doing, trying to get through Ravenholm as quickly as possible because it's spooky, but also why. Gordon needs to escape Black Mesa East and the only route is through Ravenholm. You need to get out of here. Another key storytelling aspect of the Valve way is that the map should be in media res. When you enter an area, you can always tell that something has just happened and may indeed still be happening. The first level of Half-Life is a masterclass in this kind of design. It's why you're always stumbling on battles just ending, to make the world feel present and dangerous and lived in, uh, or died in. Once a core concept has been locked in, the designers need to decide the physical shape, size, and complexity of the map they're making. Portal has very small, simple levels because the game is all about being trapped and solving puzzles with limited resources. But Portal 2 introduced all kinds of weird, big movement options, so the levels opened up a lot. The Half-Life games are more exploratory and therefore more complex and sprawling. But Ravenholm is way more cramped than any other level in Half-Life 2, which makes it a great example of the Valve Way's most elegant design elements, layers and wayfinders. Valve levels send players up peaks and down valleys, which is why you're always hanging out on rooftops like you're a 20-something in your first apartment building and you don't mind sitting on tar paper. Lots of other games do this, but where Valve excels is wacky, memorable ways of pushing players to new heights. Sure, you have moving platforms and elevators, the salt and pepper of player transportation, but also momentum flings and slides. In Ravenholm, you start at the ground floor of a building, fight your way to the top, and then jump into an open water reservoir. The layer's rule is like the Chekhov's gun of Valve games. If you start at the top of a big silo, you know you'll end up on the ground floor by the end of the level. Valve levels are mostly very linear, meaning there's only one way forward. In play, the path you take looks more like a family circus comic. That's because the designers always include side corridors and hidden rooms branching off that you can duck into for some loot or just alone time. This gives the illusion of non-linearity, and between that and all the layer looping, it makes even relatively small areas like Ravenholm seem giant and endlessly explorable. But if you're making a level this intricate that only has one way forward, you need to make darn sure that your players are not getting lost. Which is why Valve makes extensive use of something called Wayfinders, which is just a general design concept that covers anything that keeps people from getting lost. A lot of times, the start of a level will offer a little peek of an area you'll eventually get to, usually through a window or a chain-link fence. Players often start high and then descend, which gives you a great vantage point of where you're going, and sometimes lets you pick off a few enemies first. You explore a little, you loop around, and suddenly discover that you're standing in the very place you were looking down at earlier. It's a simple technique, but it does a lot to make Valve levels feel real and interconnected, rather than just free-floating Skinner boxes. Another key wayfinder that Valve does so well is landmarks, which naturally orient the player while adding world-building elements. The Citadel is a great example of this because you circle around it for, like, a lot of Half-Life 2, as is the bonfire you find in the main square of Ravenholm. Not only does it set an appropriately grim tone, but it's an important visual clue of your location as you loop through the buildings and side alleys desperately looking for ammo. You never step out of a building in Half-Life and struggle to reorient yourself. I appreciate this now more than ever, having recently beaten Control, a game that I love but cannot navigate even though it has literal signs telling me where to go. Not that Valve games don't use literal signs too, but more often they use a very subtle form of wayfinding. 
eye-catching lights. The designers are always careful to use environmental lighting for this. There are no progress marker UI elements lighting up, it's all in-story features that just happen to show you exactly where to go. Once you notice this, you'll see it everywhere in Valve games. Like, those dark corners will probably have loot, but the way forward will always be lit up like a trash barge on the 4th of July. After the rough flow of the map is in place, designers have to fill it out with all that fun stuff that constitutes gameplay. In the Valve way, this means playing around with the experiential density. This is one of those hidden concepts that all game developers think about, even if they aren't using Valve's specific terminology. Experiential density is a measure of how often the player performs some gameplay action. High density makes the play feel fast-paced, like a parkour game where you have to hit another jump every other second. Lower experiential density can make a game feel more contemplative, like a walking sim. Some companies have rigid equations for when the next bit of interaction should happen, but the Valve way is a little bit more loosey-goosey, allowing for a variety of pacing even within a single level. An easy way to increase the density is by just adding more enemies. But it's not just about combat, especially in the Valve way, which generally recommends 5 minutes of rest or exploration for every 15 minutes of combat. The Pomodoro technique, but for shooting uncooked chickens. I timed out my gameplay and found that the 1 to 3 ratio was pretty accurate. Well done, brother! The Valve Way makes great use of functional architecture and not just the environmental lighting. That iconic crowbar gets a workout breaking through planks because anything that gives the player a chance to press some buttons will increase the experiential density. That's why you're always ducking under laser beams or breaking through boxes or turning one of those, uh, oh, what do they call these things again? At this point, you might think that the map is almost done, but actually all of this pre-planning happens on paper. Once the Valve designers have flushed out all that good content, then they hop into Source, open the Hammer level editor, and crank out something called an orange map. An orange map is how you find your way out of the orange box. <laughs> That's just a little gaming humor for you. Actually, the orange map is the most stripped down, basic version of a map. No textures or art elements. It allows testers to focus on how the map plays rather than how it looks. It's like the roughly hewn wooden toy version of a final map, but it's important because of the unbelievable amount of iterating that happens once the map is built. A well-designed level should be able to stand up on its own without necessarily having to rely on the art assets. And that's why Ravenholm feels like a Half-Life level, even though it looks very Bloodborne. Iteration is where designers fine-tune the most important aspect of the Valve way. Levels have to be fun. That seems like a given, but not all designers are going for that. Sometimes levels are designed to be difficult, or soothing, or terrifying. For Valve, that guiding core is fun. Or fun and terrifying, in the case of Ravenholm, where the horror is curbed by the fun of dunking on zombies with car traps. And there are a lot more traps in the level than there would have been if Valve didn't iterate as much as they do. Anyone who's played through Ravenholm knows there's nothing quite as satisfying as mowing down a line of zombies with a saw blade. The Valve way, more than anything, is about being thoughtful early in the design process so you don't compound your issues later. It's the ounce of prevention equals a pound of cure method of game development. I'm sure that's something we can appreciate now more than ever.